to remember to put on things. <laughs> okay. Now that's that. And now we have to make sure that we're doing this afternoon. Oh, I have to plug it. situation is unstable. And for my safety, I think I must leave by New Year's. So if any of you know anybody, mm -hmm. or can think of anybody, who has a room to rent on the peninsula, right here, you want to show in. I would cheerfully uh, collaborate about filling that room with my habitation. Greg, Greg just offered you a Cheyenne room. In, in Arizona? That um, Wyoming. Wyoming. <laughs> oh, this is going out internet now. Oh, that one just went out internet. In that case, thank you for hanging close to me. Um, because of the pressing, because we were running out of time, I cut short what I think were I, the, the flow badge, right? Here's next month's meeting. I'm going to do some rumors and gossip. Here's a little taste to get you pumped, if you have that. Okay, yes. The output, uh, the power consumption of America looks to be something in the hundreds of gigawatts. So I figure the power consumption of the er, human earthlings is in the few terawatts, perhaps. Spread over the earth, 10 petawatts would be right now more than we can handle. In a laser, I won't say coming tomorrow, but the 10 petawatt laser is now within engineering working through it. Given the speed of light and a sufficiently narrow, narrow beam, I'm, I'm making a figure close together that you can't see on it. Anyway, ripping the fabric of space and time. Yay! So come to December's meeting, I'll also talk about politics. Oh, good. Oh, goody. <laughs> 
And on that note, <laughs> Greg, anytime you want to start. Alrighty. <laughs> well, we believe in femtowatts, not petawatts. That's what we do. And we do useful things with those. So take your choice. All right. Well, greetings from Green Arrays. This is Greg, and I'm speaking on behalf of the company. We have the afternoon. I'd like to say hi to everybody there. I certainly recognize most faces after some years of coming around. Um, hope that you had a nice drive over, Chuck. Uh, nice that you didn't have to drive from L.A. Don. And uh, Michael, I'll see you in two weeks, huh? <laughs> this afternoon, um, we don't have as large of a caravan of speakers as we have in the past. Uh, basically, this will be a Daniel and Greg show for the time of two hours until it's Chuck's turn for the Firesign chat. Uh, Daniel will be partially on video and partially live from Czech Republic, where he is our hero. Uh, Stefan Mauerhofer is listening in on the net from Brenchen, Switzerland. He isn't here, but we have news from him. Uh, how the afternoon is going to go is that I pr propose to hold, uh, hold forth on Green Array's status and plans for the next hour or so. There's a lot going on, uh, a lot of news, actually, if you don't have it. Uh, then Daniel has a recorded presentation on his work with ECG, ECG data acquisition and reduction. And then I have a sh short recorded piece on low-duty cycle timing devices. And then we have whatever is left for Q&A or just generally getting the hell out of there and get some fresh air, depending on what people would prefer to do. <sighs> Green Array is now alive, well, solvent, and moving forward. This is absolutely not how we have been most of the time we existed. We began life in... Well, actually, on Friday, the 13th of February in 2009, uh, in debt to our CEO for the money that he'd put up to try and get us through until we obtained some VC funding, which we never got. After that, we stumbled along on more revenue from him, and then we finally decided that we were not going to make it unless we actually got some money in. So we paid a lawyer uh, based on money that we collected up from ourselves. Uh, to do a, do a PPM so we could make a Form D offering. And we did manage to get some stock bought at the Form D offering, and that was what enabled us to take the chip to reduction. It's what enabled us to make the avowal boards. What we enabled us to do everything that we did in late 2010 and through most of 2011. Then we started borrowing money again from Dean, and we borrowed money from him throughout 2012 until we moved to Cheyenne. In Cheyenne, we did some project work that was funded for various people uh, over the next several years. And so we actually did have a little revenue coming in. But if you looked at our balance sheet, um, the liabilities column was continually increasing. We were continually having to run on debt. And as of last year, uh, long about May, June of this year, rather, uh, we were about as insolvent as a minuscule business that doesn't have any great deal of ongoing expenses can be. Uh, we were not bankrupt, but uh, there, there is no way I could have gone and talked to a, any investor with a straight face because our balance sheet looked like absolute hell. We were in debt about $450,000. And, you know, at minuscule money in the bank, we had wonderful resources. We had all kinds of good equipment. We had 33,000 chips sitting on the shelf, um, but no revenue. So that changed. Well, one of the topics I'll cover here as we go along is how that changed, uh, but it changed in a very positive way. And as a result, uh, we now are moving and we're moving on what we need to be moving on. This afternoon, um, I will in the next period of time here, which is, you know, roughly another another 57 minutes, I'll review what the past year has had going on and what our ongoing work is and what our future plans are. And they're quite different than they were a year ago because there's now something to make future plans on the basis of. This year, uh, Stefan has continued working on his C virtual machine and his development tool environment. His intent there is to make 
use of our chips attractive to somebody who thinks it's hard to learn a trivial programming language like Forth. And so he wants to make our chips accessible to C programmers. Fine. So he made a C virtual machine. He's made a whole wonderful raft of development tools, which are kind of neat. He showed them off last year, and he's continued to work on those. But Stefan told me that he was not ready to give an update on that yet, uh, basically due to offline work requirements. So maybe next year. In the meanwhile, though, Stefan took a close look at his three-node um, structure for exciting high-frequency crystals and decided that actually they could calculate the intervals on the fly and we wouldn't need two of those three nodes. He hasn't actually implemented it. And if, if, he, if Stefan goofs around long enough, I, I won't be able to avoid trying it myself. But we will very soon, I hope, be able to start a 10 megahertz crystal with one node to, to excite it, to control the excitation process. And given that, then that means we'll have enough room there to actually be able to stop these oscillators too. One of the things that we've wanted to do, for example, with the ethernet was the ability to start up the crystal so we had a good transmit frequency when we had something to say. And then when we didn't have something to say, just go mute, go silent. And that includes turning off the oscillator, turns off a lot of power, kind of nice. We could turn it back on anytime as long as we have that control. And so maybe we'll do that with this new one node structure. And maybe that'll make it a two node structure, but heck, still a good thing. So at any rate, that's what Stefan has been up to, and uh, you know, I think it's remarkable that the two men outside of the company who have actually written the most code for our chips that I know of anyway, happen to both be in Europe. There's Stefan Malhofer in Grinch in Switzerland, and there is Daniel Colney in Czech Republic. And what's wrong with you guys? Huh? All right. Michael Schult, who was there with you and gave a presentation this morning, has volunteered to be our most recent slave. And Michael is expected to roll into town here two weeks from now on Saturday the 1st and do some more non-trivial programming with the J144. And I welcome him heartily and will enjoy the hell out of his company. It's very kind of you, Michael, to offer to do that for us. During the last year, uh, other than a bunch of side work, which was going on through the first six months of the year to try and keep the bills paid without putting green arrays further into debt, um, Todd Corum, who might be known to some of you there, uh, who now works for an outfit called Alias Exploitation Technologies in Virginia, called up and wanted to make sure that our chips were available. And this led to um, his company's use of the GA-144 as a low power sensor hub to be mounted on the body of a soldier, the living body that is, as part of the Battle of, Battlefield of Things initiative of the DOD. Um, Battlefield of Things initiative is a lot of things, but his particular fraction of it is showing that it doesn't necessarily cost uh, a further amount of heavy batteries to be able to collect data off of a soldier's body and report it temperatures and pressures and respirations and maybe galvanic spin responses, all kinds of useful stuff that you can measure easily. Um, but basically, it is a low, low energy, low duty cycle demonstration in this sensor hub role. Um, we've sold some chips to his company, and we also designed for him a circuit board. Just a second, let me get sort of grounded to something here for a moment. So um, we designed a circuit board for him that is reminiscent of what I've heard some people talking about. They want a little lower cost breakout board for the 144. Well, given the charter of that sensor hub, um, it also needed the ability to have some high level control on board because it was gonna have to hook up to and fire up radios and talk to them in order to report these data and stuff. And it's also talking to some fairly interesting sensors. So um, being able to run high level language like Polyforth is important. Therefore, this is the little board we made for Alias. Uh, it has all of the computing resources on it that the eval board does. There we go. It has two GA-144s, it has the two megabyte SRAM, it has the um, hundred and, well, the 16 megabyte SPI flash, and it has a watchdog circuit, watchdog and reset. And everything else is off board. 
uh, we ran out of room for enough hitter pins for all of the I.O. of both chips. So what is brought out is all of the GPIO and some of the analog and enough stuff that you can basically talk to it from off board and program it and one thing and another. So that is, that is our small little board. And we might actually sell something like this one day. But for now, that was the nature of this effort. And it was kind of fun getting it shrunk down that far. In fact, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and good, good practice at board layout. So we're waiting for the next step. Uh, Todd also has been hawking that board around to other people that are involved in that initiative uh, on the belief that some of them could take advantage of the 144 as well. So we're looking forward to seeing where he goes with that. It's a fun effort. Now, along comes May, June. Last fall, fall, in fact, right about the time of fourth day last year, uh, a fellow residing in Japan uh, called up and wanted to buy some chips. Chip, chip. And lo and behold, he took those chips and actually built stuff out of them. And he came back asking questions like, well, why doesn't it work correctly with this flash I bought? Well, it's the wrong kind of flash. It doesn't have the old fashioned fast writing technology that the ones on our eval boards did. It has the new fashion one. So you need this different code. Well, the guy got far enough to find that out. So yes, he was laying out boards and he was running code. Um, and he asked when our next chip was going to come out. And I had to explain to him that since we're broke, our next chip is not going to happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, the nice fellow then allowed that, well, that's too bad what it would cost. So I told him about what it would cost. And he said, well, I'll keep my eyes open. Now, last spring, along about March, he allowed, you know, I'm doing a project right now that might actually enable me to fund you guys. Wow, that's amazing. And in May, he said, it is happening. And in June, he said, stand by for Bitcoin arriving in two weeks. <laughs> a lot of Bitcoin. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Um, so what we've received from this gentleman, who will be identified shortly on our website after I've cleared everything we say about him, he's a fairly private person but a programmer, good programmer. Um, he made to us what is called a capital contribution. There's a nice section of the internal revenue and the securities code where um, somebody can give a corporation money to persuade them to do something that they think is desirable. And they can do this as a capital contribution that goes on the balance sheet as excess paid in surplus. It doesn't go on a stock, he doesn't want stock but also it isn't income. So we got a good deal of money from the man. We paid off all of our debt. That was the first thing that we did. Um, and, and we've otherwise made ourselves more robust. And we'll talk about that later. But at any rate, um, that's what he wanted from us. And that's what we're duty bound to do. We're, we're pretty much honor bound having taken his money to go ahead and make the next chip. So we will. We promised it. Um, he wants to see that next chip, and he also wants to see it suitable for what he wants to do with it, which is that he would like to be able to make uh, really amazing high-density AI structures with a lot of chips in them out of our chips. And so we're going to make some changes to the design to the I.O. Um, so that it's more feasible for him to do that and for anybody else who wants to do that sort of thing. So at any rate, this uh, load of capital came at us in June, and we have been trying to make use of it. What have we used it for? Uh, we've used it to pay off, as I said, all of our debt, which was about 450000 bucks. So now the lower left quadrant of our balance sheet only has the capital accounts. Isn't that nice? And the upper left quadrant has a shit ton of cash and stuff. So now all of a sudden our balance sheet looks in such a fashion that I'm not embarrassed to go talk to somebody about investing in the company. Well, that's a great improvement. That was one of the two things we decided to use the money for. And the other one is to move on with our plans and projects, including designing and building another chip, as we promised him that we would do. So what are some of these projects that are now ongoing? One of them is the new evaluation board. I held it up while really we were goofing around. This is the fabricated EVB002. Uh, it is not dramatically different from the current one. 
other than that it has nice gold metal on it instead of nice silvery metal. Uh, other than that, it has a much bigger flash on it. Yeah, come on, this damn thing. It's very hard to move backwards, isn't it? Okay, so there is a 16 megabyte SPI flash instead of the little one megabyte one that we used before. This was big enough to act like a disc, thank you very much. Um, there's a bunch of other repairs happening to various things that were messed up, like the VGA connector that was backwards and upside down. Um, we had unfortunately laid out the power supply such that we had to put very expensive high voltage caps down there. Now we don't have to do that anymore. Um, we fixed a couple of LEDs up here in the uh, serial I.O. And also down here, this is one of our Ethernet 10 base T piggybacks. It can plug right in there, but if you unplug it, there's also layout for all the circuitry on it underneath. So we'll be making two versions of the eval board, one of which has all of the stuff from 10 base T on it, and the other one can be upgraded to run 10 base T by adding one of these. Why did we do that? Well, we have 100 of these. <laughs> may, as well, <laughs> may as well try and create a market for them. <laughs> so at any rate, this is the new eval board. What we still have to do is to get the bill of materials back into, into correct shape. We didn't do that right the first time. And then to go get someone in hopefully Colorado to stuff it. I'd like to be able to go to their shop and test their first board on the day they get it out of the line and give them permission to go ahead and make the rest of them. That'll make a board house happy. We used to have to dick around with them. They'd have to run five of, us, five of them for us and ship them to us and wait a week for us to say, go ahead. But if this way, if I can just drive down to Colorado and plug it in and see, make, make sure it passes all the tests and if it does, Go ahead and make them. So that's one of the things we will do because we're out of eval boards. We have been for better than a year. And so this will be the new generation eval board. More projects, tools. We have a lot of tool building to make. Uh, and this all precedes making the next chip. Uh, for the benefit of people that are programming our chip, Array 4.3 is in operation. In fact, Todd's using it on a daily basis. To make Array 4.3, we, we took a new set of premises. The premises were, let's have a system, a programming system that looks and feels and acts the same, whether it's running on a PC or runs on the chip. So on the PC, it runs in my same fourth system, which is available for zero license to green arrays. And on the chip, it's running on Polyforth, which is available for zero license from fourth ink, as long as it's running on the chip. Um, to the extent possible, all the tools that exist are implemented on both of these, such as the ability to assemble code for the GA144, such as the ability to make boot streams, such as the ability to stuff boot streams into another chip using serial interface, such as the ability to make flash boot streams, uh, the ability to do a serially oriented uh, integrated development environment, plugging in and uh, inspect and change and look at registers and stuff in nodes. That is all supported now on both the chip and on the PC outside, except that, of course, the chip can send a message to another node in a microsecond, whereas the PC can send one bit in a microsecond. Uh, so it's a little bit better, a little bit more interactive when you're on the chip. Also, taking data from a process going on at a bunch of nodes, you can do it at much higher speeds inside the chip than we can possibly do outside on a serial line. So there are a couple of things that are not there on both of them. For example, soft sim is kind of pointless on the chip. It's a big data processing project. doesn't factor well onto our architecture. So I'll let the PC do that. Um, but everything else... Once you've got Polyforth running on one of our boards, that board is sufficient as a development system for other chips on other products or for the two chips that are on that board. We can, for example, hose a boot stream out through the snorkel and ganglion. Remember, we talked about those last year. Um, that can all be done now under control of Polyforth. So you assemble some code, you stick it into a node, you run it, you go see what happened, and no serial lines involved anywhere. Kind of nice. Um, Basically, then, this completely supplants Colorforth for the purpose of programming the chips and substantially reduces the amount of teaching we have to do to get people up to speed to be able to operate and program our, our, our silicon. And that's a desirable state to be in. We don't like to spend a lot of time convincing people to try something. Uh, if they already know how to type, then we don't have to teach them to type. So that's a good thing, at least for the point of view of trying to get some kind of in people actually trying to program our chips, about which I would say hint, hint again, folks. Um, 
And that's, that's where we're at with Array 4.3. Uh, the manual is being written as the code is completed. And uh, again, Todd is our principal test case for usability on it. Uh, and it should be released sometime during 2019. Now there is a new CAD system called GLOW, which is called GLOW just because that's what it's called. It's not an acronym or anything, but um, the goal there was to refactor OCAD. Uh, OCAD's factoring was such that to adopt a different geometry or a different set of design rules basically entailed touching practically everything. And that was a poor place to be in. The, the motivator was that we were expected to and required to and agreed to lay out silicon at 28 nanometers. And in order to adjust OCAD to do that would have been a major undertaking. So instead, we rewrote it. And in this case, it's refactored so that the part of the code which characterizes the design rules and the geometry that is being used is a very small number of blocks that goes on top of the basic engines for doing things like extract, for doing things like um, layout, and for simulation. Simulations just running off tables. That That's not um, uh, geometry specific. That's The extract is what's geometry specific and the analog simulator just runs from the table. So at any rate, um, we got most of the way through that. We realized that in the course of all of this, but let me let me backtrack, how, how it is that we were able to make workable asynchronous circuits in the first place is that our primary tool for working on the design is an analog simulator. And Chuck had to really do a fine job of minimizing what it took to do a good analog simulator because the available analog simulators are both appallingly expensive and, sh and also slow as hell, extremely slow. Um, T-SPICE, there's absolutely no way you could practically simulate a node running a few instruction sequence in T-SPICE in less than a matter of months. Anasift is probably faster, but one seat license for Anasift is 100,000 bucks for one year. So screw that. Um, the, the brilliance of what Chuck did was to notice that what these guys were doing was sitting here with transistor models and all kinds of interesting higher order models so that they could run the simulator at a slow cycle speed, at big time intervals. And then of course, you've got to interpolate what happened <laughs> using your models during all of that time. Chuck says, why don't we just cycle at a picosecond and just do straight physics? Just move charges around. All that we have in this thing is programmable resistors, namely the transistors, which is a three terminal device. It's got a gain curve and a drain curve. And so all you've got to do is you consult the table with these two arguments and you get what the effective conductance of the thing is. So we know real trivially, trivial arithmetic, what a given transistor is going to conduct based on the voltages across its terminals. The voltages across its terminals are defined by either the rails or by signal nets. The signal net's just a capacitor, and it has a certain amount of charge on it, measured in attocoulombs. And so all that happens is that if you know how much charge is on a given net, you know what its voltage is, you know what voltage it's presenting to the terminal of a device, you know what the voltage on the other terminal is, you know what the voltage on the gate is, you quickly consult the table, you find out how much charge moves through the transistor, that picosecond, and at the end of calculating that for all the transistors on the chip, you move the charges and do it again. Now this works great. It works very well. Uh, it's elegantly simple and we can run it like stink. Not only that, but that machine back over there has 10 honest to God I, um, I-7 386 type computers in it. It runs 20 threads, quote unquote, 20 registers, that's a big deal. But it has 10 actual computers in it. That guy is gonna be running all 10 computers in parallel on our new analog simulator. And it will therefore be running 10 times as fast as anything we've ever done before. If that works to my satisfaction, then the next purchase will be an 18 processor I-9. 
because we'll be using them. And that's what we're using threads for, my friends. We, we, we don't think we have a multi-programming problem at all to solve, but we do have a multi-processor problem to solve. And frankly, it'll cost me less time reading the manual to manage all those processors in there than to just let Windows run the threads. So I'll let them run the threads, big deal. Um, at any rate, we still have work to do on this. And one of the things that we discovered when we were looking closely at our simulator again during this 28 nanometer exercise was that there are still discrepancies between what our hard sim analog simulator predicts and what actually happens in the real equivalent test circuits that we laid out and put on silicon and measured. Um, we're very close to it, but we're not right on. But the thing that we did notice during the 28 nanometer exercise, we did an extract using caliber of our test circuits, our standard test circuits that went to silicon, and then use that extract with T-SPICE to see what it thought our test circuits would do. Well, actually, in that case, T-SPICE came closer to the actual behavior of our test circuits on the silicon than did hard So this means one of, one of several things. Um, we're, we are re-deriving the transistor curves, our gate and drain curves, based on um, empirically exercising the simulator from T-SPICE. And then we will plug those into our simulator and see if we get different results. We will also carefully review what capacitance Caliber was extracting. Uh, that's going to be an expensive thing to do. It's going to cost us probably 12 grand for the tool that will give us clean schematic from the net list. And if you've seen those net lists, oh my God, you want to look at them. <clears throat> um, that's real work for a slide. But the, the main point is that we're going to look at a clean schematic drawing of the extract done by Caliber on our test circuits and see what it thought the capacitances were and how those differed from what we think they are. And see if there's something we're overlooking in the existing OCAD extract. The goal there is just to make the input for the GLOW simulator closer, if we can, to the actual behavior of the silicon. And that would be a nice thing. So that's really where we're headed, and we have to finish that whole project. The proof of the pudding before we start using low and earnest layout is to prove that we can reproduce with additionally small differences the layout and the, uh, the Gerbers, if you will, not Gerbers, but the uh, um, GDS2 files, which came from OCAP. So if we can reproduce the existing masks, then we're set to go. If we have a better simulator, we're set to go. We'll tear right on in. And that is the next tool that we have to make. Now, a third tool we need to make. Uh, two years ago, I gave a tour of our lab downstairs that included the IC handler that we bought, um, planning to make a whole lot of tests for Sunrise Systems before Sunrise Systems canceled the project. So the handler is still there waiting for us to design and fabricate a PC board with the test socket on it. It's one thing we have to do. It has to be surrounded by all of our test circuits. It has to have a 144 to run the show. The run 44 has to talk over Ethernet to the PC that's inside the IC handler to tell it what to pick up and where to put it. And then we have that little project to finish that tester. Um, we'll probably have better test code in there now because we're going to be wanting to classify the chips a little better because there are things we've never been able to do because we didn't have any automated way to test chips. Now we can actually try binning chips. We can see if there are chips that are better at low temperature than others, for example, or chips that are a little faster than others, or whatever we want to check. Also, when we get a burr up our saddle about some little thing we're curious about on the chips, it now becomes feasible to run a, a tray of 240 chips through and test that parameter on all of them. So the test circuitry will be more versatile than what we have now on our existing test board prototypes. But we need to finish that project before we can move chips in quantity, and hopefully we'll be able to finish it before we need to move chips to Todd in quantity, right? So these are the three main tool projects that we have in the offing. Array 4.3, Glow, and the automated test equipment. At that point, we're ready to tear into the next chip. And there, there are some high-level goals for the next chip. Fit into the same package. It would like to have a compatible pinout with the existing chip. It would like to be more versatile than the existing chip. 
it would like to be more energy efficient than the existing chip, believe it or not, that's feasible. And we'd like it to work reliably over a wider environmental range of temperature and voltage. Um, we know for a fact because uh, Marcel Melli in Jaw Canada, or excuse me, at, at Jaw in, in Zurich, proved that you can run our chips down at 1.56 volts as long as you're not needing the right RAM. That's pretty neat. Wonder how much lower we go if we've solved that whole RAM problem. Um, but, but basically, covering a wider range is good. One reason why it's desirable to cover a wider range is that if we could, for example, reliably run at one and a half volts, then we wouldn't need to be so persnickety about needing 1.8, which unfortunately is a voltage you can't find a battery at. We can find one and a half volt batteries. We can find 2.3 volt batteries. Um, we just don't find 1.8 volt batteries. We know the chips works very high, very well at higher voltages. It leaks a little bit more. And uh, if you were concerned about running at 100% duty cycle for 10 years and we're running at more than 10% over 1.8 volts, oh my gosh, the transistor might weaken by 10% in 10 years of 100% duty cycle. Of course, no application for our chip really runs at 100% duty cycle. And it's all silly. Well, but, but no, we run fine at 2.4 volts. Uh, the breakthrough voltage, the punch through voltage is 3.6. And one of the things we're going to test here this year is exactly high a volt, how high a voltage we can run a 144 at by itself, because it has to be. You can't, none of this other crap that it's surrounded by on the, on the eval board, for example, will work at that. And so we have to talk to it using something that's not in that environment. But I want to know how close we can get to the 3.6 volt punch through before our chip stops working correctly. And once we know that, we'll be able to start thinking about what is the right strategy for running off of a battery to, co to, to coexist with other circuitry. It's very painful to have to put up with the inefficiency of any power supply. And these boost and, and, and bump supplies um, are not all as wonderful to use as you might think. You actually have to look at the dynamics. We're capable of enormous DIDT. Daniel Colney had a wonderfully delightful experience in gathering data for his paper that will be presented next. Um, that turned out that he was measuring artifact caused by his power supply, his nice linear power supply, whose transient response was to drop its output voltage by 12 millivolts when one node running. 12 millivolts. That's almost enough to take it outside of, you know, if you were, if you ran 10 nodes, you'd be outside of the operating range of the chip. And against that, you have power supplies like, for example, the nice switcher, which it responds to those transients real fast, but it produces giant noise spikes. Um, batteries are very nice. If you can just sit there and run off the battery, it doesn't do those things. It droops a little bit, but that's only resistive droop internal resistance and stuff. So there's all kinds of good compelling reasons why it's a good idea to run off a straight battery if you can and eschew any kind of a booster buck uh, power supply unless you absolutely have to have it. So that's one of the things we want to do. So these are, these are minimum goals for the new chip. We want it to be as upward compatible as we can possibly make it. We don't want to blow up anybody's code. But then on the other hand, there are not that damn many people that have written code for our chip. You know, the old saying in the Unix community, we can't fix a bug because someone might have grown to depend on it, right? Heard that before? Um, we don't think that way. Uh, if we don't see a compelling economic interest out there that has invested the time and money to make something out of our chips, then we will not slavishly guarantee upward compatibility just in case they would have done something economically valid with our chips if they could. You know, it's nice. We'll be as nice as we can. But the, right now, the only person who's buying our chips in, in any quantity at all to make something out of is Todd. If Todd's happy, I don't give a damn about anybody else. It's the way it has to go. So what are the ways we're going to address some of those five points that we are sure we're going to deal with on the next chip? Um, our existing SRAM design, and this, you know, by the way, in the new world of, of first to file and not first to implement, um, if, if there were a patent lawyer in the house, uh, he'd probably tell me not to talk about any of this. 
but the only good we've ever gotten out of patent lawyers is to be screwed by them. So I'm a little bit jaundiced about taking advice from patent lawyers. Screw them right back. Um, our existing SRAM design is absolutely minimalist, and it has an unfortunate couple of things about it that, as a result of that design, cause it to not work well at low VDD or low temperature or both. Uh, this is a problem that is soluble by driving the right lines differently, and we'll be doing that this time around. That should enable our memory to go down to considerably lower temperature and lower voltage. We'll see how low we can actually run it at that basis. After all, in many respects, the only thing that's different about the memory than any other latches on the chip are that the way in which it's being driven. And since the way we will be driving the memory latches is more like we drive the other latches in registers like T, uh, if we're able to run the chip at 1.56 volts without memory, maybe when we get this little exercise done, we'll be able to roll, run the whole thing down. And if we can, you know, 1.5 isn't that much farther. We'll see what we can do. See what actually we can do. And that's one of the first things we want to test when we get the first shuttle run back is how low can we go in that regard. Also, the change that we have to make to the memory structure in order to be able to do the right management that way also gives us a real easy way to stop driving the right lines when we're not actually writing memory. Right now, the right lines going up through our memory track whatever is in the T register. And there's a lot of capacitance there. Remember, VDD, VDD squared C over 2 is what it costs you to change the state of a capacitive load. And there's tens of femtofarads on each one of those wires. Many tens of femtofarads, more like a more like hundred. A hundred and a quarter is what I remember from one of them. So the deal there is, all right, we'll do that. Um, you can run a simple test case on the chip by um, just saying, loading the snap up with alternating all ones, all zeros, all basically minus one zero, minus one zero. And say, just run a loop of drops and you'll measure a certain amount of energy being used. And if you then change that to all the same value and run them through, you'll notice dramatically less energy is used. And that isn't all in the ALU. That can't all be the ALU. We can't really prove it without actually building it, but my feeling is that the basal power consumption of the chip doing everything will dramatically reduce because we don't write RAM that often or that much in most applications. Right now, every instruction executed potentially is going to drive those lines. And as soon as we get done with this, only memory writes will drive those lines. So it's my hope that um, the small number of picojoules, like the seven picojoule typical instruction cost, is going to drop considerably. That'll be good. Another thing that we need to do in the way of making the chip more efficient is um, what we're calling a smart I.O. read. There are conditions under which you have no choice in our chip design uh, than to pull the I.O. register. What those conditions are is that right now a node can be listening to all four of its ports, or it can be listening to three ports in a pin. And as long as only one of those things happens, there's nothing wrong, no problems, the chip, that node picks right up, it knows what happened, uh, it knows what it, it goes off and, and deals with it. The problem that we face is that when a node is in an application where stimuli are capable of coming at it that are not synchronizable by the application code. Like, for example, over here comes a signal from the net. Over here comes a signal from a sensor. The net and the sensor are not synchronized in any way whatsoever. If I have to eventually combine the intelligence that came from the signal from the net and the signal from the sensor, at some point in there, I'm going to be listening to two things. And right now, the only way that we can listen to two things and not basically shoot ourselves in the head is to pull the I.O. register and find out who's trying to talk to us and then go say, what did you say? Polling the I.O. register is a 100% duty cycle operation. You're sitting there burning a good solid 3 milliamps 24-7 polling. And that's always been a pain ever since we realized there were cases where we could not get away from having to do that. 
And gosh, you know, if you've got two of those going on at six, pretty soon this chip that should be on average using microamps is now on average using milliamps. That's no good, a thousand times worse we, than we want it to be. So uh, what we're going to do about this is another one of those little things that some a-hole will probably try and patent. And you know, all I can say is I know where you live. Um, we're going to be able to, in the new chip, read I.O. in such a way that the read does not complete until the state of that register differs in some way from what it was the last time we wrote it, read it. And you can do it something like that. You use exactly the same polling loop that you would, except your duty cycle is now not 100%. It's whatever the frequency of those actual bits changing is, which is going to be considerably, considerably faster than um, less than ten peak, uh, less than ten nanoseconds. It's it's going to be a thousand or a million times slower, or maybe a billion times slower in most realistic cases when you're getting realistic stimuli from realistic processes. So every one of those nodes that's currently burning three milliamps might burn three microamps or three nanoamps. Well, it can't burn only three nanoamps. It is going to burn 55 nanoamps of leakage, but that means it disappears. It becomes vanished, a vanished load. All right, and that's good. That's what we want to be. Uh, and so this should be able to be implemented. We expect we expect our second prototype. And when we get those back, all that it will take is minor changes to the code for things like the Ethernet interface, for the memory controller, for the three master memory controller, um, and for the Serial I.O. for Polyforth and E-Forth, all of those will become non-power consuming operations rather than the serious power consumers that they are now. And that's very important. And that will certainly benefit good old uh, Todd and his friends a lot too. So we're, being, we're really looking forward to that. It's, it's one of the, the two first two things are the big power savings that we can do right now without any major architectural change to chips otherwise. Um, it is annoying to have to spend $12 for an external SRAM to run a virtual machine in. And so one of the things we're going to pro prototype immediately is bulk internal SRAM. What we'll do is go ahead and compile some ARM SRAM. The biggest unit of, well, we'll compile, we'll compile some ARM SRAM and drop it in there. And we'll be able to use that for main memory for virtual machines. And that then, in turn, will free up 36 IO pins if we don't need the external memory. So we will make those pins more programmable so we can use them for GPIO purposes as well as parallel ports. So those are the four major future changes that we propose to make to the chip uh, that we know about. Uh, the RAM improvement, the smart IO read, internal bulk SRAM, and 36 programmable pins. We've already talked about what the RAM improvement is. And we've already talked a little bit about the smart I.O. read. Um, the internal bulk SRAM is going to be really interesting. Uh, the way we propose to deploy it is that the largest block of that memory we can compile with the ARM tools, which, by the way, require that you have a Spark station. <laughs> they have not upgraded the damn compiler, and they never will, apparently, for 180 nanometers. So there we are. We have to keep the Spark stations running. Um, the largest we can make is an 18 bit by 8K word, five nanosecond or two memory. That's dynamite. And there's room, we can enlarge the die that we're currently using enough to fit a row of six of those across the bottom of the chip and still fit into the same. Uh, lead frame and the same package that we do now. So the proposal is that we will hook one of those six 18k or 8k by 18 memories to each of six nodes on the bottom of the chip. One of the things that we can do is to use one of those memories as a buffer for some app, part of an application, independent of the other other five. And so we have potentially five asynchronous high speed, like five nanosecond, reasonably bulk SRAMs available to us, run by a separate node in each case to route, route the data through in some process that we are needing that much buffering in. Or we will use the 
heretofore unused warp port to allow those to basically make a bus across all of those nodes that have memory on them. So we can cheaply and fastly concatenate them as a contiguous memory to run poly forth or C or E forth out of, or other things like that. Um, and that's the, the long-term goal for that test RAM to make sure that we can do this without spending the extra 12 bucks and also burning all those 36 IO pins. Um, one of the things we don't know, well, there's several things we don't know. Uh, those memories run hard and fast, can burn 125 milliamps, according to the compiler. That is a lot. That is a hairy amount of current. And so it's going to be a major sheet metal layout problem to get the power down buses to those damn memories that can sustain that kind of power without metal migration happening. So that's going to take some very careful layout. And we got a lot of wired route to do that. We're going to build hardware in there so that not necessarily we're going to be running those memories at 200 transactions, 200, uh, 200 million transactions a second, but we will be running those mem memories with as little latency as we can get. So there will be special hardware around the interface between the node that owns the RAM and the RAM. It's better to do it that way because in the case of an external SRAM, we don't know what the protocol is going to be. If it's on the chip, we know exactly what the protocol is going to be. There's no reason to generalize that uh, just in case we put different silicon on there. <laughs> so we will arrange that the memory operation doesn't take a lot of our instruction times. And this should make all the virtual machines go like the wind compared to the way they do now. Um, the, the latency should drop by over 100 nanoseconds for memory operations to the, to the current external memory, and that will dramatically speed up all the virtual machines. Um, so the wiring is an issue. The interface circuitry, getting that right is an issue. The power busing is going to be a major issue. And then finally, the question that we don't really know the answer to and we won't, because you know most people don't spec things this way. Um, they say that the memory runs at five nanoseconds. All right, that's fine. What does it run at at minus 50 degrees C? What does it run at? at it minus 80 degrees C. They won't tell us. They won't even work because almost that layout is not going to work at the performed, at the rated performance. Same is true at a low voltage. It's probably not going to work at the low voltage at rated performance. So what we're going to have to empirically find out is, does the ARM SRAM even work at 1.7? Does it work at 1.5? What's the minimum voltage? What's the minimum temperature that that damn stuff will work at? If the internal memory compromises us so much that we cannot run our virtual machines across a reasonable environmental range, then we're going to have to find some other resource that ARM to get the memory layout from. The reason we'd go to anybody is that the memory layouts for dense SRAM in any CMOS process seem to always completely violate the design rules of the FAB in order to achieve the high density. And so most of the high density SRAM is only available from people that have gone to the substantial amount of expense and hassle of working with the fab on these things and then prototyping the heck out of it and, and getting something that is manufacturable, uh, but, but which is very denser than the standard design rule would allow you to get. But it, it obviously would be somewhat pointless to add internal SRAM, which is it turns out we cannot operate even by reducing performance at a lower temperature, lower voltage. So that's one of the big things that we'll be testing the heck out of right away when we get prototype chips back too. Programmable pins. All right, we've got 36 pins that are each connected to an 18-bit register in one node, node seven and node nine. Each have a, uh, the, the, the up register is an 18-bit register directly wired bit for bit to those 18 pins for parallel ports. Um, there are a couple of unfortunate things about that, one of which is that the parallel ports start their lives out as outputs with random data in them. And so that makes it kind of useless for driving buses because until you can get the chip program, they're going to continue doing that. So they're just going to be stomping all over whatever is going on on any bus until you manage to get a boot streamer out there and change what the hell the thing's doing. Um, but the other issue with it is that we don't necessarily have a use for parallel ports, so not sure that many people. And meanwhile, you could use a heck of a lot more GPIO than we have now. One way to look at that is that um, 
anything you can do with a one-pin node, you can do more of the two. -pin. So it'd be nice to route some of those wires to also be able to be driven as a second pin from all of our one pin nodes. That that immediately provides something intelligent to do with a whole bunch of them. And then we just need the switching circuitry in there so that we can change to that mode of operation from being in parallel ports. We definitely want to come up being in parallel ports the way we are now, but we want to be able to override that later. And that's also stuff that's going to take a change to the uh, automated test equipment, test boards. So we will have at the very minimum, the ability to use those 36 pins for GPIO on some set of nodes in some way by saying we want to do it in a certain way that we have yet to have yet to work out the exact architecture and wiring for, but it'll be fun and it will, it will be a real nice thing. And then we'll have, compared to practically any chip, just shit tons of GPIO, and that'll be nice. Um, another thing that we promised our benefactor to do is that we're going to add four more certeses. Right now we've got certes which could conveniently go up and down from nodes one and seven. We're going to put certes options going across ways two and certes options going up and down. Uh, this way we'll be able to build a, a cube with high performance. We're also going to improve the certes design while we're at it so that the certes A can turn the line around in a bit time instead of a long time. We're going to upgrade it so that there's at least some mechanism for detecting an error, at least a single bit error. And we will add some mechanism for handshaking and perhaps retry. Otherwise, it's pointless to be able to run instructions out of the CERTES receive register. If it's easy for a single noise pulse to come along and bork a bit in one of my instructions, I've just potentially lost program control until not only me, but the entire giant array of chips that I'm part of gets rebooted, reset and rebooted. Um, not very acceptable. So the rules that have to be never run code out of a CERTES, always add overhead to CERTES communication so you can detect errors if there's any way that you could lose program control by believing what you got and stuff like that. So we'll improve the CERTES, we'll make them more robust, we'll make them more suitable for general use over long distances and through bunches of nodes by adding the flow control. Same way we added flow control to the um, to the virtual port in node 300. And, and have six CERTES instead of two. So that's part of the programmable I.O. pins. And again, and there's, a, there's other things we can do. If we, if we can figure out how to wire it, and this may take some busing and addressing, who knows. Um, most of these, well, any of our pads has everything physically in it that it takes to be a DAC. And as a matter of fact, any of our DACs could be a bipolar DAC in the sense of a push DAC or a pull DAC. Right now, all of our DACs do is source current. And the way we make them is we subdivide the P driver transistor into nine scheduled transistors, so we have nine bits worth drive control there. We didn't do that to the end transistors. We could do it to the end transistors. If we did, then we'd have control over effective maximum current through the pad when we're pushing it up or pulling it down. Um, if we can figure out how to get the wiring to all of those nodes to be able to program the strength of their transistors, then we have the equivalent of a DAC, a bipolar DAC that we don't have now at all, at every GPIO pin. And that would be kind of nice because for things like driving LEDs, controlling peak current controls LED color shifts. You don't want to do that willy-nilly. And you don't want to do it with external ballast resistors. Why, why bother with all of that? So it would be useful to be able to do it. We're thinking about that. Again, it's a problem that has to be solved because that's a nine wires that have to go to every pad is a little extreme. But if we can run a nine wire bus around the ring and a dress off of it and put a register in each pad, each pad then that's much more doable. Um, there are other possibilities for the next chip. Um, Chuck prototyped a whole bunch of different ideas in the F-18B. And any of those that we can incorporate reasonably easily, we probably will in, a, in at least a shuttle run, make sure that they still work and everything. Um, the the F-18B has some good features. Go read the, read the manual on that. Read the data sheet on it uh, if you're interested. Um, it has a much more comprehensive way of waiting for um, either data from ports or from a pin. If you jump to the pin and the pin goes, you get an instruction word back. 
and the instruction word says read IO return. So you basically call the pin and you return and you know where you where you came from. It's kind of neat. Um, there also are greatly improved ESD structures in the F18B pads. We'd like to incorporate those we can. Um, we're pretty well satisfied that the rush to find something to put in ROM is probably a bad idea. And what have we is that we put in ROM is not necessarily all that useful. It's easy to understand why some of the stuff, like for example, the analog nodes, really benefit from having things like uh, Michael's um, duty cycle control on the DAX for higher resolution uh, DAC control if you're driving the resistive load or an RC network. Uh, that's that's nice to nice to know about. It's all good stuff, and it's nice to have the code there. Uh, same there. To, okay, so you're an analog node. It's probably a good place to have uh, transfer functions like uh, transverse linear filters and like Chebyshev polynomials. So those pieces of code are sitting there in those nodes. But for the rest of it, um, it's not clear that what we put in all of those the right stuff. Furthermore, we also did something really silly. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. So we put eForth in ROM, and we put the drivers for the SD RAMs that we've never built anything with the 144 to attach to <laughs> in ROM on the 144. So there's a bunch of code in the 144's ROMs in those nodes down at the bottom of the chip that has never been executed, probably never will. Oh, well, darn it. And then goodness knows. Uh, we. We only were able to start thinking seriously about redesigning the chip recently. And so we haven't, by any means, mined all of our thinking yet adequately on the subject to say that we know what we're going to do completely. At any rate, we are now up and running again technically. And we have a lot of money to work with, enough to, enough to actually get a new chip to production. So damn it, we will. And what else are we going to do? Well, now that our balance sheet looks decent, we move over to being business guys. Uh, the balance sheet looks decent, and we are going to seek additional capital, both from Silicon Valley, uh, and I'm going to be seek seeking it from old school farmers and ranchers here in Wyoming. The pitch to the Wyoming guys is all of our smart kids leave the state for something to do. They go to Colorado. They go to California. How would you like to have a nice little high-tech company that could give decent jobs to smart kids here in Wyoming? It's a, it's a pitch. We'll see what the we'll see what the reaction is. Another thing that we will do is to found a nonprofit company that'll be on in it'll be up and on the air before the end of this year. So it has a 2018 date of origin. Um, it costs all of hundred dollars and takes a few hours of your time to do that in Wyoming. Big deal. And so we will have a nonprofit whose charter is to provide summer training programs for kids, high school age. The summer training programs will be whatever we can muster the resources to teach, silicon design, programming, you name it, real-time programming. Uh, it'll be a community effort. The goal is to try and raise about $1,000 per kid for a six-week program in the summer that has a follow-on during the school year. The way that works is we give them a simplified web-based version of OCAD to use. We give them a pretty much a cut-and-tried environment in which to do some layout. Let them actually lay out some circuitry. We do a shuttle run for them by us doing a wafer run that is a multi-project multi wafer. Each of the several chips that's on that wafer, there's like 16 144s in a reticle. And so we've got 16 different species of chip that we'd be making, and each one of them would have potentially 144 student projects on it. Reality to be more like, more like limited by periphery. But even then, you've got um, 36 plus 6 uh, plus 12, 48. You could do 48 projects on each of 16 chips. So a thousand bucks per kid would easily pay for that vertical make and also for the wafer run to produce it and for the packaging. And so what we'd get back is actual silicon for each kid where we could selectively enable just his part of the circuit on that chip and he could plug it into a socket and see what it did. So the, the deal there would be since it takes a minimum of, oh, uh, four weeks to get the way the uh, reticles made and it takes another minimum of 10 or 12 weeks to get the wafer run done and it takes another four weeks to get them assembled. Uh, you're looking at half a year anyhow. So well, the deal would be kids would come to the classes in the summer and if it was the silicon design class sometime in late winter, early spring, they'd get silicon to mess with. 
And I, it's an experiment worth doing. Uh, by calling it vocational education, which is what it is, because we contend that all these kids, if they know Ohm's law and understand what an RC time constant is, um, it isn't education, it's vocation. You already know everything you need to know. Just push some stuff around, draw some transistors, and hook them up and see what it does. It's no more um, uh, education-y than it was when we used to wire switches and light bulbs and relays together and make digital circuits on a piece of wood, right? Did all this whole lot during uh, elementary school. So we didn't have to have professional educators to teach us to do that, did we? Right. So Green Arrays is not after calling it education. We're going to call it vocational training. And we will not be required to go get teacher certificates to be able to tell people how to do what we do for a living. How about that? So that's the goal for the, the nonprofit. And that pretty much covers where we're going. We're actually not just sitting here saying, God, I hope that we can survive another year. We are a going concern. We have money in the bank. We have no debt. And it's a whole new world for us. Thank God to that one man who made our lives change and our whole world change and who will get suitable credit on the website soon. And with that, I'll open the floor for a minute to any urgent questions. And then we have Daniel Colney, who will have at least a half hour plus his Q&A. And I have one final video. And then any remaining time is either Q&A or take a break. Any questions from the floor? Will the, uh, will the benefactor be invited to give a, a, a talk at a future fourth day event? The benefactor is a rather private man, and that's entirely up to him. I'm sure that he would be invited. This is the question of whether he would be inclined to take the invitation. Um, but the point is, he's a really good guy. He's smart as hell. Um, and he was awfully kind to us, awfully damn kind to us. But I do, I do hope that um, I do hope that he gets to um, manufacture and program the thing that he wants to build and program. And assuming that he does, I'm sure that he would like to talk about it to somebody. Greg, that was awesome. It's done. Uh, <clears throat> one of the thing that I presented today, and I'll send you uh, the PDF of it because I actually mentioned you on a page. <laughs> um, we're going to build a Whiskers 2. And oh. yeah, and um, I got Dr. Ting is on board and many other people here at Fourth Day are on board. And um, I was thinking about you, you know, having a version with your chip on it. It's actually on one of the slides <laughs> in the PDF. So, uh, you know, Whiskers was a tremendous vocational kind of um, product so if that could be that could fit right into your uh, I, I love that idea you know uh if, if building technology in wyoming you know i want to be there one day with my company so uh that, that, it's a great idea well you have a warm welcome don uh it, how warm is it it's 17.2 that is 17.2 fahrenheit right now lightly snowing outside <laughs> And naturally, it's typically five to ten degrees cooler up in Sheridan, which is an even nicer town than Cheyenne. My daughter now lives up there, and it's I visited on um, Wednesday, Thursday, and boy, or excuse me, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's a nice town. I like it. Well, thank you very much, Don. That's encouraging. Anybody else? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Okay, I really close the floor to Daniel's video. And now we switch over to Daniel. Daniel, you're up. Daniel. Roofer is supposed to play Daniel's video. Am I just supposed to play the video? Okay. Yeah, That's sure. probably on the chat over here. No, that was just the thanks for the other. But okay. Um, let me go find the video. And where am I? That's over here. I need to go back to where I was. And um, share application 
that's this guy share go back over here was supposed to share and hi my name is Daniel Connolly from the Czech Republic in this presentation I will show how greener is chip GA144 can be used to implement a simple heart rate monitor. A heart rate monitor is a personal monitoring device which allows to measure one's heart rate in real time or record the heart rate for later study. Traditional heart rate monitors usually comprise two elements, a transmitter on a chest side and a receiver. Those devices are based on detecting electrical signals produced by heart activity. More recent devices use optics to measure heart rate by detecting changes in blood flow. In this work, I have been interested in the first group of heart rate monitors based on electrocardiography principles. The electrocardiography is a process of recording the electrical activity of heart over a period of time using electrodes placed over the skin. In the simplest arrangement, only three electrodes are necessary, two being placed on arms and one on the left leg. The electrocardiogram then measures the voltage difference between left and right arms, the left electrode working as a ground. ECG of a heart in normal silent rhythm is composed of a small P wave followed by a so-called QRS complex followed by a T wave. The top of the QRS complex, the R wave, is a good point for detecting the heartbeat. By measuring time difference between consecutive R waves, we can easily calculate the current heart rate. In this demo application, I wanted to use even simpler electrode arrangement. In this arrangement, only two electrodes are attached to the chest, and the electronics is referenced to a virtual ground. Though more susceptible to noise, this arrangement is much suitable for mobile applications. Cardiac activity produces very weak signals that are easily disturbed by different kinds of noise. In 1985, Bell and Tompkins published a paper showing how to digitally process ECG signal. The algorithm is mainly used for noise removal and to reliably detect R waves. As can be seen in this figure, reproduced from the original paper, even heavily distorted ECG signal shown in the top trace can be used to detect R waves, as is shown in the bottom trace. This hard rate monitor demo project aimed at the following goals. First, to implement ECG signal acquisition using green arrays chip GA144 in the two electrode arrangement, then applying the Pan and Tompkins algorithm to extract R waves from the ECG signal on the fly and report the current heart rate, and finally to determine the energy consumed by the application. Let's have a look at the hardware used in this demo. The setup for this demo is simple. The voltage difference generated by my own heart activity is recorded between two ECG multiplied silver silver chloride electrodes. This very weak voltage signal is then amplified in an analog module and processed digitally in the target chip of the green arrays along board. Output from the GA144 is then sent to a PC running a colorful application used for visualization. The analog module is based on the scheme published by Yan. The raw ECG signal is first conditioned with a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 160 Hz. It is then amplified with an instrumental amplifier having gain of 21 dB. The differential signal then goes through a high pass filter with a cutoff frequency of half Hz. It can be further amplified with this non inverting amplifier. However, in this case, the signal had been strong enough that I only used this op amp as a buffer. With this buffer and voltage divider, we generate a virtual ground of 900 millivolts with respect to power supply ground. The whole module is powered with 1.8 volt supply, the same as GA144 chip. Now I will show the floor plan of this application. This demo is implemented in the target chip of green arrays and outboard. It uses only 25 nodes, of which more than half is just wire nodes. 
The simple application consists of several parts. There is an external consoles. It is implemented as a 32 kHz crystal oscillator in node 570. When the oscillator is running and stable, it launches an analog signal sampler in node 670. The sampler uses ABC to digitize signal from PCG preamplifier. Digitized data are sent downstream to the signal processing block. This block implements the Ben Tompkins algorithm. At the end of signal processing, node 612 detects the R wave and sends this information via its down and left ports. For the purpose of this demo, the ECG waveform is sent from node 616 via wire nodes to a buffer in 510. This buffer provides necessary time delay corresponding to Ben Tompkins processing time so that the signal from R wave detector is in sync with ECG waveform and can be combined in node 608. Here, fiducial markers are appended to data stream at points corresponding to R wave peaks. This stream is then sent via async serial port in several A to PC and displayed in a scrolling window of a color fourth application. The signal from R wave detector is also sent to Bieber in 715, which generates a short beep whenever the R wave is detected. Now we are going to see how the application is implemented in detail. The oscillator is described in green arrays of node 12. It uses a watch crystal and it provides a clock signal to our node 617 via shaft pin. The code from the up node is slightly modified to start 617 only when the clock is running and stable. Register A is pointing to a port shared with sample node. When the crystal excitation phase ends and the clock is not running, a zero flag is sent to 617. Otherwise, a non-zero flag is sent to it. Thus, 617 does not start sampling before the clock is running correctly. The sampler is using analog nodes ADC. The ADC is basically a fast-running voltage control oscillator which has linear response between 750 and 1300 millivolts. Setting virtual ground of the preamplifier to 900 millivolts ensures a sufficiently large interval of linear response and voltages above ground. This is desirable as a typical ECG waveform is not symmetric to mostly positive signal. The note is sensitive to both rising and falling edges of the clock. The rate of clock ticks is too high for sampling and it's downsized to a reasonable 256 samples per second. The code of the sample node is following. The node starts suspended, waiting for a signal from clock node. When it comes, we enter port sample. Here, register A is first set to left port. It means that the store instruction will suspend the node according to the state of wake up direction bit in IO register. In other words, it suspends the node until the next clock edge. Then we enter a loop skipping 255 clock edges. Notice that we use instruction store B to toggle the wake up direction bit. If we wait for the next clock edge before calling word ADC. Therefore, the sampling rate is 1 out of 256 clock edges, which is 256 hertz. Entering word ADC, this phrase turns ADC's voltage control oscillator on by setting an appropriate date in IO register. Now we set register A 
our data, which means that using store instruction does not suspend the node. Do the first reading of ADC counter. Then we wait for 500 micronic groups, which correspond to approximately 1300 milliseconds. And then we do another reading of the counter. We calculate the difference of the two readings, which corresponds to the voltage on analog input. Then the result is sent downstream. Notice that the stack is preset with values totaling wake-up direction B and also keeping the VCO turned off except for the sampling interval. This is necessary to keep energy consumption low. Here we can see a recording of an actual analog signal digitized by the sampler node. When I stop the recording, you may notice little spikes that correspond to R waves vary in 50 Hz noise. Also, the signal is offset from the zero line. This has to be dealt with during the following signal processing. As shown in the introduction, the Ben Tompkins algorithm is a robust method of detecting QRS complex in noisy ECG signal. Processes the raw signal in several steps. A bad pass filter uses influence of 50 Hz interference, baseline water, and D wave interference. The desirable bad pass is approximately between 5 and 15 Hz. In this demo, only low pass filter is implemented. High pass filtering is provided by an RC high pass filter in the signal preamplifier. After filtering, the signal is differentiated to provide QRS complex slope information. After differentiation, the signal is squared. This makes all data points positive and thus non-linear amplification of the output of the derivative. The purpose of moving window integration is to obtain the slope of the R wave. The QRS complex corresponds to the rising edge of the integration waveform. A fiducial mark for the temporal location of the R wave can be determined from its rising edge. The Ben Tompkins algorithm then uses several dynamic thresholds to detect the QRS complex, which were not implemented in the demo application. The signal processing algorithm is implemented in these five nodes. The stream of sampled data is found through a low pass filter, a differentiator, squaring function, a moving window integrator, and finally an R wave detector. We start with the low pass filter. It is implemented as a finite in the pulse response filter. Parameters for the filter were calculated using T filter, a web based application. The filter was set to have pass back from 0 to 50 Hz and a stop back from 48 to 128 Hz. The stop length was set in such a way as to place a notch by the 70 decibel attenuation at 50 Hz. This is the code implemented 11 times FIR filter. First, we fetch the new data, then we call word LPF. It uses word tabs that is available in ROM of majority of GA144 nodes. This work is followed by a table with filter coefficients and temporary storage words. Implementing a temp to delay line with summation of scaled tabs. The coefficients are expressed as 17 bit signed fractions. Upon return from LPF, we discard the oldest row value and send the filter output to left port for further processing, 
and to upboard to display ECG waveform in comfort annotation. This recording shows how the signal from the low pass filter looks like. Next step in data processing is numerical differentiation. Use a five point stencil approximation of the first derivative, which means that for each point xn, two preceding and two following points are also included in the compilation. Again, we use word tabs with five coefficients. The coefficients are taken from the original paper by Penn and Tompkins. The procedure is similar to low pass filter. We read data points from left point, then calling the word d slash dt, we calculate the first derivative approximation, and finally the resulting value is sent right point. And this is the output of the differentiator. Next step is to square each data point. This is done by multiplying each data point by itself. If data point values fit into 8-bit side number, we can use a faster multiplication proposed by Chuck. First, we calculate the absolute value of the incoming data. Although squaring works with negative numbers as well, the multiplication procedure requires the multiplier to be unsigned. Next, we prepare the multiplicand by duplicating and left shifting the number by 8 bits and we place the multiplier on top. Finally, we run the multiply step 8 times and set the result downstream. Squared signal looks like this. We can see a large amplitude of the signal where our wave is supposed to be. Another step in signal processing is moving window integration. We use a 32 point wide window. Its width has been set at Pericoli to span full QRS complex. The algorithm is simple. For each point, we calculate the sum of the last 32 data points. The sum is stored on top of stack, which is preset to zero. And the most recent data points are stored in the array 32 words long, starting with address zero. A register is used as a pointer to that array. In the word sum, we first subtract the last data point in the array, pointed to by register A from the sum. Then we read a new data point, store it in the array at the same place, advancing pointer by one, and add the new data point to the sum. The pointer is rolled over if needed, and before sending the sum downstream, it is divided by 16 to simplify its visualization. Here's how the signal looks like after integration. It is a quasi-square wave signal with rising edge at the location of the original QRS complex, all other peaks being practically eliminated. The last step in signal processing is detection of R wave position. The code compares the relative change of amplitude of the signal. When it exceeds seven units, an edge is detected. First, we wait for a rising edge, which is detected with the word rise. When we detect this edge, we send a true flag to the left and down ports. Then we continue searching for a falling edge with word fall. And finally, the falling edge, we send a false flag to the ports. When executing words, the rise and fall for each data point. Points tested, we set a false flag downstream until the edge is detected. Thus, each data point tested generates a false flag, except for the only true flag set when the right edge is detected. The threshold value of seven units has been set at Pericoli. This is where the original Pentamphens algorithm uses direct thresholds. 
Now, we can append a fiducial marker to the ECG signal from the low-pass filter. We read the data point of the ECG signal and trim it in order not to overflow the scrolling window in the Confluence application. Words min and max are taken from Chuck's website. Then we read a flag from our read detector and set both flag and data point to PC. The Confluence application then displays data points and fiducial markers and it also calculates and displays the current heart rate as can be seen in this visualization. The GPIO pin of node 715 is connected to a piezo buzzer. We continuously read flags from our wave detector and call word B or true flag. This word generates a short square wave signal driving the buzzer. And this is the resulting ECG signal with our wave smart also acoustically. Well, the application is running, measuring my heart rate. And the last question that remains to be answered is how much energy it consumes. Hence, I will be talking now about energy aspects of the application. And if he wants to determine energy, he has to measure current. Current measurement is well described in Greenery's application brief number 3, as well as the application note 12. Either onboard or external power source can be used. And it is recommended to use 6.5 digit ammeter, which has low shunt resistor value and a sufficient resolution. Alternatively, an external low volume shunt resistor can be used with low resolution both meter. The useful, this approach provides only average current. If we want to see current variation in time, another approach has to be used. Therefore, the following methodology has been tested. First, we remove a jumper between pins 2 and 3 on pinhead connector G14, which connects on board supply power to VCC core. Then we place 2.2 ohm resistor between those pins. And a scope probe is attached to the pin number 2 as a high impedance input voltmeter. The idea here is to register voltage drop on the low value resistor in time and convert it with Ohm's law into current. The approach is simple, but when measuring the baseline signal with all target chip nodes suspended, I got this trace. After discussing the issue with Craig and doing some research, I found out that the oscillation comes from the onboard switching regulator as can be demonstrated on this figure taken from LT3480 datasheet. The amplitude of the spikes is less than 15 millivolts, which is well within the specification. Though not a problem when supplying power to an application or measuring average current with an ammeter, it is nevertheless unsuitable for my method of current measurement with a scope. Therefore, the methodology has been modified. This time, we connect pins 1 and 2 of G14 with a 2.2 ohm resistor and supply power to the core of the target chip from an external 3 volt lithium battery using a low drop out regulator. The scope probe is attached to the pin number 2. Now, the baseline is flat and stable. However, when measuring current during the heart rate monitor activity, we can observe inconsistencies such as voltage going above the baseline. This is obviously an artifact that there should not be voltage higher than that provided by the voltage regulator. Again, discussing with Craig pointed out that the selected regulator is not really a good one during transitions, as can be seen on this figure from datasheet. The long transients response clearly explains why we measure voltage higher than that of the baseline. In order to solve the issue, a differential voltage measurement had to be used. Not having a differential scope probe, voltage on both pins 1 and 2 has been measured, and the recording traces have been subtracted in a spreadsheet to get voltage drop on the shunt resistor only. Averaging data from 10 measurements leads to a reasonably noiseless trace suitable for further analysis.
For current measurement, the application has been modified and all unrelated parts have been removed. There has been no ECG waveform recorded and no data sent to PC. And the paper node has been converted to just trigger scope recording. Using this arrangement, such scope traces could be recorded. This is a current in time trace calculated from differential voltage obtained in the scope. The time scale has been shifted so that zero remains at the moment when the current starts to rise above the baseline. The trigger point is then at the time of four microseconds, and we know that this is the moment when the node 715 is activated. We can analyze the trace from the beginning till the trigger point. This is the time interval when an analog signal is sampled, processed, and R ring is detected. The rest of the curve from the trigger point on must be related to recharging any capacitors that supply power during each current increase. This capacitance is due to filtering caps of the system power supply lines, as well as internal capacitances of the target chip and capacitances of the PCB. The trace of the active part has basically two stages. The first one with duration of 1.3 microseconds, which corresponds well to 500 micronex loops, and can therefore be attributed to the sample node. The second stage, lasting for 2.7 microseconds, can be further divided into three segments. One lasting 1.7 microsecond, which corresponds to execution of more taps 11 times, and results from low pass filter running in node 616. Then another of 0.8 microseconds corresponding to five times execution of watch taps, which can be attributed to a differentiator in node 615. And finally, 0.2 microseconds, which is generated by a sequence of execution in the nodes 614, 613, and 612. Now, when we can attribute individual nodes to the parts of the current curve, let's analyze the current magnitude for individual segments. In the first segment, current reaches 1.8 milliamps. Since only node 617 is active in this segment, we can identify two current things. One is corresponding to ADC's down counter running at the frequency given by the voltage control oscillator, and the other is due to a micronex loop determining the sampling interval. The value for micronex loop is about 25% less than that reported in green arrays data. It cannot be explained solely by variation in manufacturing processes. This value should not deviate from the typical one by more than 15%. We have to assume that the current does not reach its peak value during 1.3 microseconds. The energy is partially supplied from capacitances even at the end of the segment. In the second segment, current reaches 4 milliamps, which is in a good agreement with Green Array's data book, reporting typical current for one node running at full speed between 3.25 and 4.25 milliamps. There are never two or more nodes running at the same time for a significant time duration. Thus, the current and time analysis is consistent with expected values determined by the code being executed. Having analyzed current and time, let's focus now on energy and power. Charge passing through the target chip is equivalent to the area below the current versus time curve. It is therefore possible to determine the charge by integrating this curve numerically. We integrate the whole curve, including the part after the trigger point. This is necessary as it represents the charge supplied initially by capacitances. Doing so, we get a charge of 16 nanocoulombs. To calculate the energy consumed, we multiply the charge by voltage. For the sake of simplicity, we assume the nominal voltage of 1.8 volt. The energy consumed is thus equal to 29 nanojoules. This energy is consumed for processing one analog sample. 
Multiplying the energy by sample frequency of 256 Hz, we get energy per second. This is the average power, which in this case is about 7.5 microvolts. Finally, dividing the average power by voltage, we get the average current of about 4 microamps. By all those simple calculations, because a lot has been said about GA144 being a low energy chip, but rarely it's shown what it means in practice. For instance, how long time could we run the heart rate monitor from a battery? Let's see. A single CR2032 lithium battery has capacity of 235 mAh. According to GA144 data book, the chip draws 7 microamps when fully suspended. The application draws about 4 microamps. So we need about 11 microamps on average. At this rate, a single 3 volt lithium battery will supply power to the heart rate monitor for almost 2.5 years. At this lifetime, even Forrest Gump would not have exhausted a single battery during his legendary cross culture run. As a conclusion of the presentation, let me express some thoughts on the topic. There are several areas where the application could be extended in order to work as a real product. First, the ECG electrodes could be replaced with capacitive ones. This eliminates the need to have a good electric contact of the electrode with the body and makes the use of the monitor more agreeable. The information about heart rate could be transmitted wirelessly, for instance, with the end protocol or low energy Bluetooth. There are many ready to use modules for such wireless communication. A smartphone application to display the heart rate and to provide other useful functions would be needed as well. Although it has been shown that a single coin battery can supply power for a lot in the long time, it would be definitely interesting to incorporate the energy to the heart rate monitor. It could harvest energy, for example, from vibrations or heat generated by the body. Though not part of my current plans, I still may test these extensions in the future. I'd like to express my acknowledgement to Green Arrays for providing me with demo more. Also, I would like to thank Craig Bailey for invaluable discussions and Jack Moore for sharing his very fourth code. Thank you for listening. And now, Daniel, you have the room. Questions? A silent room. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to a lot of radio. And for a hundred bucks, I can get something from my smartphone that detects atrial fibrillations like an EKG. And I'm curious if you all have uh, researched your competition, what, what's current in the market? It's not a product. Oh. What? It's a what? That, it's a learning exercise. Yes. I'm not sure they get. Are you productized yet, Daniel? Are you planning to go be a product? No, 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 no. No, this, this exercise. Well, I did it for two reasons. The first one was I just wanted to try to do this ECG measurement because it was it was really fun to to attach electrodes to my body and and to see what what happens. And second, uh, I wanted a simple application where I could try to measure the current, the, well, the energy consumed, because that's the point of using GA one forty four chips in my applications. So. The, the conclusion I, I've presented, uh, what could be done to make it a real product, that's just an afterthought, what, what can be done, but I really don't intend to, to make product like that. OK. Question? Any other? I have a, an addition. Go ahead. <clears throat> 
Well, Daniel, you know, the, the importance of actually documenting that you can run this application for more than a year off of a CR 2032 is important. Um, it's certainly important in the context of the battlefield of things, too. I found out recently that the average loadout of a modern soldier of the U.S. Army in batteries is 10 pounds. Wow. I would rather have 10 pounds of ammunition in my pocket than 10 pounds of batteries for practically everything. If I were, if somebody was trying to kill me, frankly. Um, and, you know, the fact that you can get a smartphone to do it is just fine, but your smartphone is not going to be practically rechargeable on the battlefield, is it now? Yeah. 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 Just a point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, even better than battery is energy harvester. That's something that's really interesting for me. Battery is good, uh, good thing for many reasons. It has a, a noiseless voltage, as you discussed about uh, about uh, power supplies, switching power supplies. So battery is fine, but still you have to replace it. And the energy harvester is something that's probably the best way to go from long-term perspective. Imagine sensors that are part of the building structure. You really don't want to replace batteries in those sensors, but on energy harvesting, they can run years or tens of years unattended and still provide information about uh, uh, quality of the structure like bridges and so on. Do you have any recent numbers on how much uh, you can get from body heat differential? No. It would be good to know. I'm, a microwatt is not a whole lot. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Another question here. Yep. Go. Uh, well, I, what I was first came to my mind is use a little tiny uh, bit of lithium polymer battery and a little piece of a solar cell. Mm. And, then, and then it would run forever. Because you don't need, you need so little, you don't need full sun, just ambient light will recharge the battery during the day. And it might, it might be like half inch square. Okay. I agree absolutely. Uh, actually, one of my projects that are waiting for, for beam being executed is exactly what you said. Little lithium polymer battery and, and uh, solar cell both implemented in a very small mobile robot, but that's still to be done. Yep. Cool. I was, I was just uh, thinking when, when you mentioned uh, energy harvesting and Bluetooth low energy, I was thinking whether you, have you, have you considered uh, ambient backscatter radio where they uh, mm. have, uh, it's like RFID, but it's unpowered on both ends. So uh, instead of, um, the radio is not an emitter, to my understanding. It either reflects or absorbs the ambient RF from like TV, radio, NPR, whatever, radio, radio stations. Either reflects or absorbs the ambient RF to send a one or a zero. And uh, I think, um, I forget which university is working on that, but I think, um, yeah, but if you look up the ambient backscatter, pretty interesting stuff. I just yeah. Yeah. I think technically that should be possible. The point is that when the the GA chip, when the duty cycle is very low, you basically can harvest very low amount of energy for a long time and accumulate it and then use it for a useful thing for, for several microseconds and then again GA chip would sleep. So the point is whether we can harvest this kind of energy and store it reliably, so there would be less leakage than, than what we can really harvest. If that's possible, if you can accumulate that energy, I think it should be possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, um, this, uh, ambient backscatter radio had a low power, and low power uh, microcontroller or something like that on it. So I think this would be flexible for that. It just basically tunes the matching network as far as I know. Right. You know, thank you very much for bringing that up. And incidentally, now that Green Arrays is alive and well again, 
I would sincerely appreciate anybody that runs across a good harvesting technology, good communication technology, anything that is very low energy required per transaction that looks promising, fire me an email at least and send me a, a, a URL of a, of a citation for somebody writing about it, please. Yeah, okay. Start gathering that. I have one other question. Uh, I, currently I'm using the PIC, uh, the DS PIC, micro, one of the DS PIC microcontrollers for its uh, charge time measurement unit for a time domain reflectometry. I'm wondering maybe the green array chip would be in many ways more suitable for that or more flexible at least. <laughs> Not an ab not an absolutely accurate time base. You'd have to work out a calibration procedure. But Jesus Christ, if we can't do a TDR, what are we? Yeah, I mean, it could be it's certainly more flexible than using a thick um, yeah. TMU yeah. for that. So I'm, I'm thinking about making the switch to green for that mm -hmm. after seeing it, after seeing the stock. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you. thank you much, Dennis. <laughs> thank you much, Dennis, for playing the video, and thank you, Daniel, for all your hard work. Okay, Dennis, would you roll that last little video clip, please? Okay, now we got to do this again. <laughs> okay, while Dennis is figuring it out, um, this all this reflects and documents what happened during a little exercise that was done to flesh out the last page of text of the new edition of AppNote 2, where we talked about maybe maybe being able to be situationally aware at a very low duty cycle over a long period of time by measuring that long time interval uh, through a very big resistor into an RC time constant off chip, and thinking that that might be a power efficient way to be situationally aware at a low duty cycle without requiring a, an extremely accurate time base for the moments of looking around. Okay, I think I've got this ready. I can figure out how to get back to something that will play it. One moment, <laughs> there we are. Especially since the currents are going to be vanishingly small. 
Then we go out here in this particular case, we're running a 10 megal resistor into 100 nanograms. So, that's about from this whole circuit here, it goes about one second, right? And so, we would expect to cross our solution threshold about that. So, what we do with this, this is, let's say, 708.1. And we take and sample this, you know, 708.17, and we turn this guy on, let it go high, wait for it to cross our positive switching threshold, say cool, then turn around and drive it low, take it low switching threshold. It seems like a good idea to put Daniel with me because if you've got BDK 1.8 and ground here, 0.9 here, our switching thresholds are like right here, about a half a volt for the wind. And so what we would be doing is driving the thing up to here and then down to there and then up to here and down to there again. And that seemed like a good way to do this, keep more or less continuous time series without having to run multiple of these to find a way to time the discharge procedure. And so that was the goal, was to act like this. Well, we had. And we looked at the nice permanent key plate, and it said that we were burning about 70 micrograms, not root three. Okay. Um, the leakage of this particular chip was running about 13 micrograms. So we were looking at a fairly substantial, like nearly 60 microgram cost to the oscillation of the RC between the switching thresholds. Why? Ha! Unstoppable. Forgot that it is not without cost to perceive things by moving slowly on a chip. Look what we've got here. Um, we have essentially negligible leakage. On your 200 to 300 megaohms. On our input structure. So that is good. And our capacitance is only over two and a half bucks. Again, the negative people can read that. So, what the heck was the problem? The problem is this. Forgot all about. Our nice triggers on the input. And if we're running the signal continuously between the thresholds, the hysteresis bounds of these guys here, they're constantly conducting the shifts are that way. It's just how switch should behave. The, the peak current was like 120 micrograms for these shifts from the input voltage right at the center. And it tails off on both sides. So here is this nice distribution of current consumption by these guys as we vary the signal right there in that range. So there is where our 60 microamps cost of these guys perceiving the slow moving signal And yeah, just to prove that it didn't get much better if we instead ran two different RCs, one of which went like this, and when we got up here we triggered then we would drive this guy low, we would wait until he crossed the negative threshold, then we would signal another node to start doing its guy and do the same thing that does. That way we at least gave this RC a head start on getting toward ground before we started driving the other up, which would tend to keep these guys going between ground and the switching point rather than hovering in between. And in fact, if we didn't quit for that, we started to get out. We were running more like 120 microns. But when it was all said and done, the energy consumption of this strategy with two nodes and two RCs, same deal, 60 microns of current average, and if you have a key with a 10 second average, um, which is a pretty stable with an 80% of the thing. So, at any rate, bottom line is, cost off. Doesn't cost anything to drive it, but it costs. Hell of a lot to receive. So, the next experiment that we'll do for low frequency stimulus for situation only is to see 
needed an actual text loss energy to run an external uh, CMOS timekeeping device. Uh, there's one of the claims to run a hydrogen interaction that we can claim We'll find out what it costs when it's actually stimulating this. And next year we'll document that in the labs. It's certainly not going to be 100 nanometers. Um, that's not the cost because it's going to cost you some of these videos. Stimulate us, and of course, they never argue about that in data sheets. They argue about what they're doing with the chips sitting there all by itself, doing nothing in the room. But uh, we use the SPI because SPI is more power efficient than is I squared C in general, especially if people have thought that this is the primary environment of electric or primary control. So that is the outcome of this little experiment. And so a little more of a footnote in that part too. But anybody who was hoping for us to be right about this, that eh, oh, that's too costly. You can't run the slow moving inputs and get away with it. Right. Moving to the bench, here is the setup used for running two of them. One on the right is being driven by node eight. One on the left is being driven by node seven or eight. Um, both of these are 10 meg, 100 nanofarad. RCs and one of the shunt resistor here to make current used by that chip, all three of those power supplies are being driven by that through that same single resistor. Teeth is connected across the resistor to get the voltage drop. Uh, here is a trace currently running. And this is being driven by a pin off of node 8 that is being driven in sync with its drive to the RC. You notice that it drives the RC for um, about uh, 580 milliseconds, and then it drives it to ground. And during that longer low period, we wait for it to come down to the lower threshold. Then we uh, send the signal across to node 7 to 8 to do the same thing, waiting for node 7 to 8 to send the signal to tell us to go again. So we've got a total period of this cyclic thing for about two and a half seconds. And here is the current being used. That is reading 74.5 microamps with this lovely voltmeter. 74.5 microamps. That's a 10 second average again. So there we are. That's that's what we've learned with this little exercise. I think we're that one's done. Q and A. Yep, yeah, yeah, we're, we're off to something else. Hang on, hang on. Go away. Stop. <laughs> Stop sharing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we don't have a whole lot of more time here before Chuck's window shows up, but in case there are any questions. Um, and also for everybody's amusement, there's what the code looks like for the 60 microamp um, exercise that we were doing um, with a single node running the thing. This is how such an application as that looks in Array 4.3. Um, the top four lines of code right through there from lines one through four is what assembles all the code for that node. Oops. These two lines here uh, are the path that's used by the snorkel and ganglia mechanism. Um, well, actually, just by the snorkel to run a boot stream up onto the other chip and up around the periphery of it, and down the column eight of nodes to program all these things. And this code here is all interpretive stuff that builds the boot stream to be punched out through node 207 on the host chip to program the target. And that word there, store snork, is the one that blasts the bootstream out through that node as a, as a DMA channel. So that is the whole application in one block. And that's uh, one of the things that's different about 
three, four, three. So any questions about any of the stuff we've had to say this afternoon before we take a break and get ready for Chuck? Once again, a silent room. <laughs> Yay, we put him to sleep at last. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your attention, gentlemen, and thanks for staying awake. <laughs> if there are any ladies present, I'm sorry they must be on the non-public side. Nope, didn't have any this today. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have much happier things even than, than these to report next year. Be good. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Now. We've got to get ready for Chuck. So I have to go back. You're going to be up here, I'm assuming. Probably. Oh, one apology. There was a mistake. Um, I was trying to read the size of that high going pulse off of the logic analyzer and said 580. And obviously, it was more like 800 milliseconds. Sorry about that. We'll forgive you. <laughs> OK, I'm going to shut off my projection internally and um, go over the other way. So let's take a short break. Get this out of here. Yep. Let me get out of the way. Should be disconnected now. Close. Close. I listen to the stream. Oh, I didn't see you. I have, yes. Either Kevin or I checks the streams. Oh, it's frequently off. <laughs> we frequently mess up. sort of see the video, but the audio. Yeah, yeah. It's very much the case. Okay, I'm going to go over here, back up just a little bit. No, we want to go back a little bit. What about What's the, what's the video connector called? This is the old style of VDI or something? Um, no, that's DisplayPort. DisplayPort. That's DisplayPort. It's like Apple. That's the full size connector. And then the later ones have this little tiny one. They're basically HDMI, but uh, I don't know about that. I think that we possibly did we between the two of you. Did we want to try to set up a microphone for Chuck? The last minute here. I, uh, I think that I think it'll be fine. A little bit quiet. Yeah. Okay. Some of us aren't sleeping well. 
screen and just have it white but talk position. So you're on the internet. If there were a bathroom close enough, you could see the where the wireless market would have how it works. That would be the old porch call. Maybe because Don't go here again. 
this one? Yeah. Well, it's the B plane. find out. Well, I guess a period of quietness has uh, occurred. I'm Chuck Moore. I'm eager to see all of you people willing to listen to me. Um, I'm afraid you perhaps expect me to say something more significant than I will, but that's, that's how it goes. I watched that video, which you saw a bit of, my 2011 fireside chat. I noticed a number of things in it. One... I had something significant to say, and, and uh, I think I said it. Second, I wore the same shirt. <sighs> this is my favorite shirt, which is why I wore it again. I can't find another as nice. The style seems to have changed in such a way as Western shirts are kind of drab. So I impinge it upon you. I do have a new hat, which I wear just to show a little bit of difference. I have a new pair of blue jeans and actually a new pair of, uh, of uh, five fingers shoes. I, I don't want to give the impression of living in the past. I'm trying to live in the future. Actually, what I do is live in the present. This is perhaps the first fireside chat I have given with the fireside blooming. I usually have a computer. But this year, I don't have anything to show you that I didn't show you last year. So I thought it would be a mercy to um, not bore you with it. I have done a lot in the last year. All having to do with my superscript fourth. In other words, taking x86 instructions and decompiling them into fourth. To do that, I have to be able to indicate registers, and I indicate them with superscripts. I actually have a couple of subscripts also. I don't recall if I had them last year. 
I have subscript B for byte, W for word, and Q for uh, quad word, quad byte, quad. <clears throat> and it looks very pretty on the screen. Uh, there are several problems with it. One is it's hard to read. If I was a four-year-old growing up with computers and this was my computer language, I'm sure I could uh, pick it up very effectively. But now I find it is uh, not intuitive. And this is worrisome because the whole point of it was it was supposed to be intuitive. That's one project. Another project has been graphics. And a third project, which I will start off with, was Euroforth. I went to Euroforth this year, first time in what, 10 years maybe, mostly because they invited me and sort of wanted to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Forth. Uh, the first fourth occurred in the fall of 1968. Since this is the fall of 2018, it was 50 years ago. Actually, it was also on my 30th birthday. Um, so you can do the arithmetic. I tried to get some help in getting from here or from Nevada to Scotland. And I looked at the internet and I rejoined the AAA so I could use their uh, travel services and nothing, it was a total waste of time and effort. I couldn't find any path. There are, none, there are no travel agents in uh, northern Nevada. So I did it myself with great trepidation. I have never planned a significant trip on my own until this year. So I had to arrange airplanes, trains, hotels, food. Um, and I didn't know if it would all work out. It was a two week, a one week trip. And it worked perfectly. I'm, I feel confident now as a travel agent, although I don't plan to do any more travel. It was not that much fun. I flew from Denver to um, Heathrow on a United 787, which is a beautiful plane I had never been on before. But it was not a beautiful trip. The plane was crowded. The seats were narrow even though I paid extra. The flight was long. I took along my CPAP machine so I could plug it into my power supply and maybe get some sleep. There was no power supply in contrary to what the websites had said. And anyway, it was completely infeasible to have this machine and the tubes and all running. So I just sat up all night and uh, got to experience some jet lag when I got there. On the other hand, Euro, Euro fourth was, uh, was lots of fun. It was in Scotland, it was in north of the Firth of Forth. 
in North Queens Ferry, a, a very nice hotel. I took the train from London to uh, Edinburgh because I like trains. Last winter, I discovered that you can take virtual train rides with a view from the driver's cab of trains all over the world. And this is an excellent way of uh, experiencing rail travel. And so I wanted to compare it with the real thing. And I took, I took the train to Edinburgh and back. And they're very nice trains. And you get to see a lot of the countryside. And a lot of the countryside is, is remarkable. They have wind turbines in, uh, in England. Lots of them. Um, the downside is they don't really produce all that much electricity. The trains are well maintained and are more comfortable than the airplanes. But still, the, the trips are long and not really that much fun. I drank far too much Coke. Um, I try to ration myself. Uh, not very successfully. It's not clear what the addiction is. It's either sugar or caffeine. But uh, I take caffeine pills in order to try to de-emphasize the caffeine in Coke. So it's probably sugar. <clears throat> they gave me a plaque celebrating basically the first fourth which was 1134th. And the plaque had a, a, a page of my original uh, assembly language fourth, which is, which is nice, which is fun. I look at it and think, 50 years ago, how much has changed? And not all that much. It's been a, it's been a fine ride. I wouldn't change a thing. In a sense, I'm glad it didn't turn out to be a tremendous popular success because I would have billions of dollars and nothing particular to do with it. I'd be burdened with all of the publicity and the notoriety of Bill Gates or someone. And uh, no, I'm. I'm better off where I am now. I'm delighted that you people like Forth and use it. I like Forth and I use it. But as you might have gathered from what uh, Greg was saying, Color Forth isn't all that popular. <laughs> um, could I have done it differently? Yes, but I'm, I'm happy with the way it is. I, I wouldn't change it. Uh, it wasn't designed to be popular. It was designed to be um, a multiplier of my productivity, as fourth was in the first place. I'm still trying to multiply my productivity. And I'm doing that with the, uh, with the decompiler. Greg showed you the, for, the source code for um, a, a, a GA144 app. They're very small. They're very simple. They have only 32 instructions. It's very easy to decompile that into fourth. Uh, no need for superscripts. No need for source code. No need for a file to store the source code in. You'll need two things. You need the object code, and you need some um, metadata. Specifically, you need some labels so that you can mark points in the source code and give you some mnemonic value. 
And you might even need a few comments uh, to explain what's going on if you have the discipline to write the comments. I thought I would try to translate that opportunity to the PC. I have a development board for the 144, but I haven't come up with a good application for it. I have one, two, three, four PCs and a Mac, which give me lots of, uh, lots of opportunity to write code, to explore code, and to uh, decompile code. I showed you my decompiler last year. That call that version two. Uh, I'm now on version five. Uh, it's gotten better and better, simpler and simpler, smaller and smaller. Version four. I have put aside for the time being because it's gotten too complicated. I can judge how complicated something is after the fact. But in the course of writing, I just write code and write code and write code until finally it occurs to me, look back at it and see how big it is and whether the bigness is justified by the uh, difficulty and the value of the uh, application. And it failed that test. On the other hand, the big improvement from last year to this year is the SIB byte. It's the byte added to many opcodes that let you do incredibly complicated things with uh, register addressing. You can take a register, you can multiply it by four, you can add another register to it, or a, a memory address. You can multiply numbers by five. It, it's it's it, the fourth sort of thing you ignore on the first pass but I had to include it in the second pass because I was using it in my code. And I wanted to be able to see what it looked like. And what it looks like is a complicated conglomeration of superscripts. And it was not pleasing. So version five, I've gone back to the simple. I want a very simple version of fourth that uses very few instructions that can be easily decompiled as the GA144. And I want to use this version of fourth to draw pictures. I have a new TCL 55 inch uh, monitor. I recommend it highly. It's a beautiful piece of equipment and it only costs $650. Next to it is my old 55 inch monitor from Samsung. I got the new monitor for two reasons. One, I was getting blurring on the Samsung. My colors weren't, I mean, I, I took a loop and look at the pixels, and the pixels were blurred. They weren't sharp. So I got a new monitor, and I got sharp pixels. And I got brighter colors and deeper blacks, too. The uh, Samsung was four years old. <clears throat> so now I have two. 55-inch monitors with a slight angle between them, and it gives me a beautiful curved 
workspace. And the second reason was magnification. I couldn't do anything on the default monitor without a three times magnification of everything. And that obviated the whole point of having uh, 38, 40 pixels horizontally. They were just thrown away. Now I have arranged things, or, or Windows has arranged for me that one monitor is times three, the other monitor is times one. And it's amusing to move a window from one to the other, but not very. So I put up my generated graphics on the times one monitor, and the programming takes place on the times three. It's a very comfortable work environment. I have a recliner, which I lounge in with my trackball and a little keyboard, wireless keyboard. So I want to put high res graphics on the times one monitor. I've done some of this. I had to put up a lot of pictures in order to uh, calibrate it, in order to show off the, uh, the resolution. But I got tired writing code. So I want this new version of, of, of fourth to generate the code for me. It also occurs that this is a great opportunity to use some, uh, what's it called, uh, evolutionary algorithms to let the computer choose attractive images to enjoy. What I'm putting up as a background on these two monitors are pictures I take with my um, iPhone 6. They're mostly, I take them on hikes, so I've got pictures of mountains and rocks and trees and lakes. And they're high res. They are not 3840 by 2160. But there is a marvelous app called Better JPEG that will um, resize and crop these images for me. They crop the images on 16 pixel boundaries without disturbing the JPEG coding. They, 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 they crop the JPEG. So you're not, de de you're not uh, deteriorating the image. You're not re recoding the image. And they have a good, al good algorithm to expand a little bit. <clears throat> what I would like to do one day is buy an iPhone 7 which is 12 megapixels and does give enough pixels so that I don't have to resize, but only crop. But what I would rather have than those pictures are some dynamically moving, attractive graphics that um, <clears throat> are generated by the computer. I don't... You can't call it artificial intelligence, but it will be something that has some creative initiative on the part of the computer to generate images which are pleasing to me. You may have seen Dawkins, one of Dawkins' books. He has a evolutionary sequence of graphic shapes. He, sam he, he flagged the shapes that he liked, and the evolutionary algorithm would generate more of, more of the same, and he trained it to, to produce shapes that he liked. I, I couldn't see the beauty on them, but, but now I'd like to, be, to do something with the same. 
build a little bit of initiative into a computer and take advantage of fourth. It is easy to alter fourth code in perhaps some sophisticated ways that will make attractive images. You know, one of the images I have shown you in the past is the logo of Color Forth with the three rectangles beautifully positioned and harmonically displayed, and <clears throat> but it didn't move. You got to have images that move. One that occurs to me kind of tritely is a billiard table. You've got balls moving and bouncing off each other, and it, it can all be done in an accurately physical way and perhaps be quite pleasing to watch. Another, of course, is uh, molecules, molecular models. Well, anyway, one of the images I put on the screen is a picture of the fourth bridge. One day we took a, a, a tour boat ride out the Firth of out the Firth of Forth under the bridges. And I took a couple of pictures of the Forth Bridge. <clears throat> that is one amazing structure. I am proud to have it as our, our namesake. It is vastly overdesigned. Uh, there's a lot of traffic on it. A lot of trains cross the bridge. And when you see a train on that bridge, it is minuscule. It's a model train. The bridge is huge. Giant round um, pillars, beams, tubular beams, well uh, riveted together. This was... <clears throat> And it's red. It's an excellent color. There are three bridges across the Firth of Forth. In the 19th century, the railroad bridge. In the 20th century, a suspension bridge. But something went terribly wrong because that bridge has been retired. In the 21st century, a wire stayed bridge, which is beautiful. Um, we went under all three, but I only took pictures of the important one. I recently watched Atlas Shrugged. I don't know if you're aware of that uh, movie. It's a movie in three parts. So four and a half hours of uh, Anne Rand's universe. In the third part, the Taggart Bridge collapses, which is the end of the Taggart Transcontinental Railroad. And they show a picture of the Taggart Bridge over the Mississippi. And it is the fourth bridge. And they have cleverly dropped the span. I mean, the bridge didn't collapse into a heap of metal. But just like the Bay Bridge, one small span um, fell into the water, and that, that stopped it. The Army engineers can repair it in a, in a week. That was fun. I enjoyed seeing that movie for that reason alone. Actually, it's a much better movie, in my mind, than the uh, critics they panned it horribly to the point where it, I'm not sure it's a dead loss. But it does get the point across that um, free enterprise is a pretty good thing. In fact, without that free enterprise, we wouldn't be here today. The opportunities for developing software are truly incredible and are not going to wane. Artificial intelligence 
is the big buzzword at the moment. Um, I read my news on, on the web. I like Apple News. I like Google News. I like BBC News. AI is vastly overblown. Yes, it can do some things. It's done some impressive things. But it's not going to put us out of business. It's not even going to write our programs. It just is not. It, it, can, it can do pattern matching. But it can't write code. I can't see any way it could write code. It doesn't understand what the problem is. And if you don't understand the problem, you can't comprehend a, a solution to it. So I think the future of fourth and decompiled fourth is, uh, is still promising. I think the future of the 144 with its very simple code is promising. Uh, who? Uh, someone mentioned the uh, unique ability of two nodes communicating with one another, being a simpler and more effective solution to a problem than one node doing the entire task. And that someone was me, now that I think of it, back in, uh, in 2011. It's a new paradigm of, of writing code. You don't break it down into you don't factor it into words. You factor the words into computers. I also mentioned in 2011 that I could put 1,000 computers on a chip. And the only reason I didn't is that I had no use for 1,000 computers or the ability to program them. It would take 10 times as many milliseconds to load the code as it does now. Um, but I was being conservative. I could easily put 10,000 computers on a die the same size as a GA144. But again, I don't know what to do with 10,000 computers. One obvious application is a neural net. A neural net with, say, 100 neurons per node would be a million neurons. That would be fun. Maybe you could do something artificially intelligent with that many. Uh, I'm not sure that that's more than a supercomputer could do, but it's more than a chip could do. And if you put 100 chips on a, in a cube, or 1,000 chips, 100, 10 by 10 by 10, 1,000 chips in a cube, you've got a billion neurons. That, again, that might, be, that might be interesting. And of course, it wouldn't use any energy to speak of. But that's not going to happen. Our new chip is going to be 180 nanometers for a bunch of reasons. One is that that's a sweet spot in the uh, leakage uh, department. If we want a low power chip that just sits there using no energy when it's idle, we can't have leakage. And the low geometry processes are notorious for high leakage. Um, except for maybe the cutting edge IBM FinFET process, which we would love to try, but can't, no way can afford, no way can I see any path affording him, unless we get a killer app and a huge volume of chips would justify uh, millions, tens of millions of dollars in development cost. 
But we can prove all the points we might want to prove at 180 nanometers. Uh, except that nobody is out there <laughs> anxious for us to prove anything. So, hey, those numbers that uh, Daniel showed were, are truly awesome, that you can have an app that runs on a, uh, your, your hearing aid battery for years. That's, that's great. Um, let me think. What was I? What? I'm, I'm sorry I haven't said anything profound about fourth, but um, I guess I'm getting into a more, more philosophical age. Uh, age leads to wisdom. And wisdom is a word that needs to be defined. Um, I'm hoping I have some. But wisdom is also slow and uh, not, not dramatic. I'm not much of a one for teaching. I, I'm sure I haven't taught any of you anything. Anything you know about fourth, you've learned for yourself. And I'm sorry, but that's just the way I am. Uh, I'm glad that other people have taken up the uh, the the chore, task, opportunity of teaching. I hope we reach some more people. It does seem that fourth is still out there, although it's hard to see. And it always has been, except for the big peak at, uh, as, as Bill said, 4,000 copies of... Uh, Think fourth, something like that. 40,000. 40, Those were the days. And I miss most of them because I wasn't involved with FIG. I was involved with Forthink. And Forthink didn't like FIG. Uh, I don't know why. It was maybe competition. <clears throat> I missed a lot of things in my life. I missed the 60s. I just wasn't aware of, of that flower revolution going on all around me. I, mean, I was here in San Francisco. <laughs> yep. But I was focused. I was busy. Um, and I don't mind missing it. Um, I'm enjoying the music from the 60s. And that, that disturbs me because I don't think any music since the 80s has, has had the slightest appeal to me. Um, well, that's, that's, that's the way it is. I've got all kinds of musical equipment. I had a 5.1 surround sound stereo low end it was logitech but still that was the last of the uh, many sound systems that i've had um with age comes hearing deficit uh i don't have any sensitivity above 10 kilohertz, which is pretty poor. Um, a lot of the sound coming out of my television or out of these speakers is mumbling rather than speaking. I've got um, headphones, good wireless headphones. I've got um, Ear pods. I've, I've, I got a pair of IQ Boost ear ear pods, earbuds that um, correct your hearing. And I calibrated them, and it, it, it only cost five hundred dollars. And this was when I was considering a hearing aid that would cost five thousand dollars. 
So this was a good experiment and it failed. It, whatever these things do didn't improve things enough to be worth wearing, which is why I'm not wearing them. My last and most successful gimmick is a couple of uh, speaker stands that put a couple of the uh, Logitech speakers right next to my ears. It's like a, a virtual headphone. And as I lounge back in my and watch a movie, uh, I can hear. One of the reasons is I don't get reverberations. My, my room is, is quite empty. And there are a lot of reverberations, which with a low volume speaker right near my ears just don't happen. I've always wanted to generate music. I've never had the uh, creativity to do so. So that's my life. I'm in the desert. I'm pretty isolated. I'm threatened on all sides by neighbors, not neighbors, but people who might build a house. And I try to wish them away. Um, it'll probably happen. It might not happen soon enough to bother me. I have my Jeep. I do a lot of rambling on back roads. I do a lot of hiking in the Sierra. I've recently started running. I've avoided that for the last 20 years for fear of damaging my knees or ankles. And now I read that they really don't get damaged as much as you might fear. And it really doesn't matter. Uh, I have very little to lose. So I might be able to run further in the mountains than I can walk and see more marvelous sights and take more great pictures and put on my big monitors. You have to say louder. Okay. I will, uh, I will try to have something impressive to show you next year. Uh, we will have to see. Thank you for listening. Sorry. Hey. Not like the lost chord. The lost word. Um, we heard from uh, Greg about his plans for the new uh, green arrays chips. I just wondered if you had any comments on what he was planning. What he's planning. No, I've been involved in the planning, and uh, I agree wholeheartedly with the changes we're going to make. The only the only problem with those changes is they add complexity. They don't subtract complexity. But um, they do have enough advantages, I think, to pay for what they're adding. Um, I, I do hope that we can put in the, what is the, um, P15B, C15B, F15B uh, instructions and, and decoding because they are far superior to the um, 15A. But it's a fairly large change to make and um, it isn't clear the level of risk we want to put on this new chip.
Greg was talking about the solution that he came up with, and he was talking about the analog simulators. No. Did that come to you right away, or did you take a little time to come up with that? He said that you just, you said, it, let's just throw the business. It, it, it came to me quickly, but it took a long time to develop the confidence that it was accurate or, or adequate because the traditional engineers that, that uh, model transistors started modeling the physics and the um, weird behavior. Transistors really are not nice. They, are, they can be made to appear nice but there are all sorts of second-order effects that are going to screw you up. I just ignored all those. I said I took a pragmatic model, and I said, look, the IV curves of a transistor look like that. Um, that's a quadratic. Where's the, where's the need for a complicated formula to include all of the variables that go into that quadratic? I'll just model a quadratic. And indeed, that is simple enough that one of the G144 nodes can model a transistor. I, I took two G144 nodes, one for the N transistor, one for the P transistor, and I can model an inverter. Um, it just takes a few multiplies. I, I, I'm sure I could not sell that to a computer design house. What do you know? Yeah. The, only, the only justification for it is that it works. But it's not linear. The problem is it's nonlinear in a way that um, I, I just chip away at it one transistor at a time. I don't try to model inverters. There are, there are gate, gate level um, simulators that will model an inverter or a NAND gate. And I use those in designing the um, Shaboom chip, and they were grossly inaccurate. For instance, in, a, in an AND gate, it makes a difference which of the two inputs occur first as to the speed at which the output appears. I mean, that's natural. If, if one can turn it off, it, it turns it off quickly, but it takes both of them to turn it on, and it turns on more slowly. Um, I started trying to write such a simulator, and just, just it was too complicated. It's easier to, mul to model the transistors and let the transistors in their interconnects model the, the, uh, the gates. Again, the problem is, if, it, if it's that easy, why didn't everyone do it that way? And uh, they didn't, and it is. I think the GA144 offers a nice counterpoint to fourth. First, it could not be programmed in anything but fourth. It could not be designed by anything except fourth. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, it cannot be marketed by anything like, but it, it, it's, well, well. well. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you again. Are we going to do dinner? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, let's have a, a final show of hands.
for the uh, at home audience. We're done. <laughs> See you next month.